Yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, well, I'm not actually invited, but uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity to talk about uh, the coupled model I can uh, get them. Uh, I can get them is an atmosphere ocean model mainly developed for the purpose of uh, research over the Baltic Sea. And um, this uh, coupling of those two models, I can and get them, has been done uh, by our institute and by the Institute of um, Baltic Sea Research in Warnemünde, mainly contributed with uh, the work from uh, Knut Klingbeil. And so uh, we finished this uh, coupling about two months ago, but we had some problems with the simulations. So um, this is now about actually the first simulations we have done. And uh, in the beginning, I will motivate my talk with uh, introducing um, a coastal upwelling event uh, from um, the east coast of Sweden and, and Gotland Island and uh, in July 2012. And then I will uh, go into the details of both uncoupled models and then, of course, um, the coupled model itself. And I can get them, it's just the combination of the name of the two uh, individual models. And then I will uh, show you the results of uh, our simulations we achieved. Okay, um, at first, let's go a bit into the detail of, of coastal upwelling. In general, um, air sea interactions are driven by many different factors, uh, such as precipitation, radiation, or wind and uh, wind and atmospheric pressure generates waves and currents and and all other things you can might imagine. There's a lot of things going on at the air sea interface. For the atmosphere, especially, it's important that there's a warming or cooling from below. That's why it's in my, our main purpose of interest uh, for the troposphere. And I'm from the Tropospheric Research Institute in Leipzig, so this is why we are interested in this. And um, for us, uh, we now look at the coastal upwelling. And coastal upwelling is mainly driven by the um, Ekman transport into water. So we have a wind blowing along a coastline. And uh, this wind has to blow in a uh, specific direction along the coast. And then due to the Coriolis force, uh, you actually get the, uh, um, yeah, you get the energy and the, the current, surface current moves into the uh, ocean and then your wind actually drives the water. And it happens in a, a 90 degrees angle, basically. So you start your wind blowing along the coast and then you're, with going deeper and deeper in the ocean, um, the, the water is moved or drift away from the coast. And then if the, the upper water is drift away from the coast, well, there must be some other water coming up. And uh, this water is actually then coming from below the ocean. So it's, it brings then deep, dense, and cooler, and usually nutrient-rich uh, water towards the ocean surface. So also for um, fishing industries, it is very important. And um, if there's nutrient-rich water coming up, then also the fish are coming up as well. So this is also interesting for fishing industries. Yeah, and um, especially if cold water comes up from the bottom of the ocean, then uh, you also have a cooling of the atmosphere. And then you have a feedback mechanism into both directions. And that's what we want to investigate. Um, we have had a study in, in the beginning uh, about available uh, coupled models for the Baltic Sea. They have been available for climate research and for horizontal resolutions, um, which are, well, large enough for um, actually showing that these events happen, but not, uh, and we are now interested in actually the physical processes of what is going on. And so we're interested in a much higher resolution, talking about a kilometer or even less. And that's why we have to couple two models which can handle these resolutions. And um, to show you that this actually also takes place and it happens quite often, um, I have here two animations. On the left side, there is uh, sea surface temperature measured by uh, the <coughs> NOAA 19 satellite, uh, but over the uh, 
first, three weeks in July 2012. Unfortunately, we, uh, there were a lot of clouds and I was not able to gain uh, remote sensing data so far. That's why we have a lot of white gaps in here. And on the right side, I'm, I'm having um, the wind map of Central Europe. I want to stop to show you that actually there is coastal upwelling available on the dates we are interested. And hopefully I'm not missing it. Uh, yeah, yeah, might be possible to see. Um, we will see it later in the results even better. But uh, there are small uh, green dots coming up here along the coast or here. Um, and those green dots are saying that the temperature is about five Kelvin less than the rest of the surface. And um, I hope maybe there's a different, yeah, there. I think you see it on the screen even better than here on the, there's green, and we will see it later on. And the wind has to come uh, from, from mainly southwest and blowing to northeast. So on the northern hemisphere, we have to have the uh, water or the ocean on your right hand side of the direction of the wind. On the southern hemisphere, it's just on the left hand side. So um, let's go a bit into the details of those models we uh, are using. So I will talk about ICANN, um, the, ocean uh, the atmosphere model, and about the ocean model. And then I will talk also, giving two slides, about uh, the coupling software we have used. ICANN is a model developed from uh, the German Weather Service and the Max Planck Institute in, for Meteorology in Hamburg. And it is uh, mainly, uh, the main purpose was to develop a unified model, which uh, allows climate research, also weather forecasting and weather research, and to combine this in one, uh, well, one major tool to handle uh, a lot of these features. <coughs> they also introduced the flexible grid nesting capability, which allows um, regional um, nesting for higher um, resolutions, which we want to have. On your right hand side, you see how this basically looks like. You have a global domain with, let's say, well, I can't really say how, what is the resolution of this, but it's large. And we have um, on the, this red area where we have a higher resolution. And um, the German Weather Service uses it as the global and uh, Europe domain currently and will soon hopefully replace the German domain, uh, the domain over Germany, which is even higher resolution. So actually then, yeah, those are representing those two. And we have um, a triangular stretch, a uh, horizontal grid, which is unstructured. And the ocean uh, model will use a structured rectangular uh, model. So we have a, a big gap um, then within our grid structures, which we will handle, of course. So I'm now pointing out a small scheme of um, the information you have to give, provide your model with uh, to do your simulation. So you have to have uh, orography, orography, land use class, of course, for the land. And you have to have some reanalysis data um, for, well, at least for those simulations we want to do. Um, the first point is that to have, you want to initialize the model. Um, and for limited areas, as we, if you don't want to do a global simulation, you just start with a limited area, so regional simulation if you want then you have to have some lateral boundary data, which are given by also reanalysis data. That's why we use um, the IFS data later on uh, the, from the ECMWF. And then you uh, fit or you start your model and then you get an output. So about the ocean model, <coughs> the ocean model um, is um, a general ester and transport model, which has been uh, developed and uh, with the Institute for Baltic Sea Research and other uh, contributors. And they are focusing on estuarine transport in uh, shallow ocean or shallow uh, water areas. And uh, that's why they also use this for the Baltic Sea or the North Sea, even for the Mediterranean uh, Sea. And uh, they try to reproduce, uh, well, barocleanic features such as upwelling uh, or internal um, so salinity inflows 
and all other things you can imagine for the Baltic Sea. And uh, they use, as I already said, a structured rectangle grid. And um, this is the area we are going to uh, look into with our simulations later on. It's called the Central Baltic Sea. And um, as I've done it with the ICANN model, um, I'm also pointing out here um, a short scheme about the ocean model, which also starts with reanalysis data for the surface. So you, the ocean model has to be driven by uh, meteorological data, which they will get from also reanalysis data. And then they have a bathymetry, basically that's the, the orography of the ocean, and to know what, where there is, um, how deep is your water. And they have um, river data, so inflow from rivers, water coming into the Baltic Sea, and open boundaries because they do also only um, um, a regional simulation, so they give, uh, give you a specific area. If you, if you go back, you also have here an open boundary, here an open boundary, so you have to have some data for that as well, like the lateral boundary data for the atmosphere. It's nearly the same. And then you also get an output at the end. Um, the coupler we have used is a software tool which has been developed by um, the United States uh, for Earth system models, especially for their purpose, but it's uh, open source, so you can use it. And um, we, we have followed this um, coupling strategy by simply applying all the um, routines they are providing us within our model. So we have to make sure that there's an interface for each model. This has been done using this specific um, NUOPSI interface layer. Um, this is a bit technical, but um, there's, a generic, there's a generic software tool on top of these, uh, all these routines by the Earth System Modeling Framework, which allows a minimized uh, amount of coding, so you don't have to write all the uh, necessary uh, routines which are already available. If it's just a standard routine you always call, then you can use this layer. And you only have to provide your model with some information like the grid you want to use, the variables, you know, the data you want to exchange. So you start with an initialization, you prepare your coupling, and then um, the actual coupled model just uh, drives all three components. I can get them and the coupling between those two models. And um, from our first simulations, uh, we have seen that the initialization takes a bit longer, of course, than uh, before with the uncoupled simulations, but the actual uh, integration of uh, your model uh, um, system is uh, not really slowing down. So we actually achieve almost the same uh, computing speed, which is pretty nice. And um, here we have um, basically the strategy how we do it. So we uh, send some data from, to the coupler and, and then it will distribute to both models. So you can also imagine um, there's a specific reason why we want to do this and I want to give you an example for that. Let's say you uh, exchange the sea surface temperature from the ocean to the atmosphere and um, you have your, for some reason, the uh, local, the ocean model calculates your sea surface temperature in uh, degrees of Celsius. And your atmosphere model does it uh, in the with Kelvin. So you have, have a gap between those data. You can handle this in here. You don't have to handle this in the models. You can handle uh, the difference in here. So you, in this case, you just uh, add uh, 273 Kelvin to the data and that's it. So if, it's, if you want to exchange maybe some data which uh, you might have to add before you can uh, put them to the next model. You can handle it here in here. You don't have to do this within your models itself. So each model just sends and receives data. So combining those two models to give, you, give us um, this fancy scheme now, but uh, since we couple now, we don't need the meteorological uh, input furthermore for the ocean because we get it from the coupler. And uh, so we have some meteorological fields we want to send from uh, the atmosphere model to the ocean, and we have sent some oceanographical fields like anything you can imagine. And a specific with our model, um, you actually can define as the user which data you want to exchange. This has not 
to be done before by the compiling. You can do it on your simulation run. You just tell the model what you want to uh, exchange, and then it does, for, does it for you. Might be some uh, restrictions like uh, if the ocean model needs two or three uh, different sets of information like wind, pressure, and whatever, and it does not get everything, then it might stop from because it says I need more information. But except of these restrictions, you're up to um, any use you want. Uh, any app, yeah, with this model. So let's have a look into the uh, simulations results of our first test. Um, we have uh, applied for ICANN um, a regional a domain with three different nests. So we have the three different resolutions. This is uh, due to the fact that we uh, received our uh, reanalysis data in the resolution of 16 kilometer horizontal resolution, which is definitely too large, at, well, too low in the other way around for our purpose. And with the nesting capability within ICANN, we can um, handle this and getting down to 2.5 kilometers in this case for this green area. This which is the resolution and the uh, smallest domain for our atmosphere and the blue area will be the domain of the ocean. And um, we have used, um, well, we have the experience that uh, it is helpful that we reinitialization we initialize our models after every 48 hours, but do our simulations for 72 hours, which allows us uh, one day of uh, spinning up our model if there might be some influence from the initialization which we can have. We, we have not looked into the fact that if we want to run our model for like, I don't know, a week, which we will do later on, a week without reinitialization, uh, uh, we would, might want to do later on. And for the ocean model, it is nearly the same. We have initialized uh, the uncoupled simulations with the reanalysis data from GFS. Um, we have some lateral boundary uh, data. And we also do a restart after 48 hours because, well, if you want to start one model after 48 hours, you also have to start the other one after 48 hours. As I already mentioned, this is now excluded from the coupled model. And um, yeah. Let's have a look at the data we actually exchange so far. We exchange um, currently only the uh, information which the uh, ocean model gets from the reanalysis data. So we have not looked into uh, um, flux exchanges yet. So we have two meter temperature, we have uh, wind at uh, 10 meters, uh, we have a dew point temperature, we have air pressure and we have uh, cloud cover. And um, I can, so the atmosphere receives only sea surface temperature. As before, we have not looked into heat fluxes yet. And we exchange our information every 15 minutes. Um, we have thought about maybe doing it more often or even less, but um, so the uncoupled simulations uh, for the ocean model receives every one hour new meteorological data. So we thought, well, we should start with less than one hour to see already some uh, differences. But uh, we didn't want to do this like every one minute or something to, to exclude <laughs> the possibility that we need might to wait for a week for the data. Uh, so these are now a um, couple of slides I want to show you about the uh, details we have received so far for the Results. Um, let's have a look at the sea surface temperature um, in the atmosphere. So this is the output. On the left side, uh, we have the output from the coupled simulation. On the right side, we have the output from the uncoupled simulation and in between the different. This is now for all slides the same. As I showed you or tried to show you with the satellite data, we have now upwelling here uh, provided by the sea surface temperature. So if this color uh, gets into um, white or even blue, then you actually see much lower temperature at the coast of uh, Sweden or even Gotland. Uh, and this is actually the uh, sea surface temperature which is given uh, within ICANN without any coupling by a parametrization 
I believe they um, update their data within uh, once a day or something. And um, which is really nice is that we see here um, this upwelling coming uh, really far into the uh, central Baltic Sea. And um, just to mention that these lines here are just the border of the area where the ocean model is stops. And then after, outside of this area, they use, of course, the data from here again. Um, the difference uh, is actually really interesting because uh, what you see is that um, it's not like that always the coupled model is warmer or cooler, it's, it changes. So we have here now, of course, we have cooler areas, which is upfilling, but now we have uh, here warmer areas as well. So there is a gap in between those data, which is uh, really nice. And we will see soon that um, I can actually react, react only on those changes. This is the only thing we have changed in, in the ICANN model, and it reacts already on that. Um, we also have the sea, surf sea surface temperature on the ocean model. And um, what we see here is nearly the same data as before, because the ocean model provides ICANN uh, with that. And we have also here this upwelling, of course. But uh, the uncoupled simulation already showed also uh, upwelling, of course, because this, that's why they have developed this model. Um, but there is a difference in between those results, which we, of course, can see here. And it looks like that the um, uncoupled simulation actually is warmer than the um, coupled simulation. And um, in my opinion, I'm, I studied mathematics, I'm not a meteorologist or oceanographist, <laughs> but uh, I believe this is the reason why uh, this comes from the fact that uh, if you uh, provide your ocean model with reanalysis data, let's say over each hour, or even, even after three hours, you have a linear interpolation between those data and you have um, a constant average wind going from one direction. So if it's coming, uh, at, let's say, at uh, midnight, and you have the next update of your meteorological data at 3 a.m. in the morning, and the wind at midnight says there is coastal upwelling, a uh, favorable uh, wind situation, then um, this will happen for the next three hours. But since we do an update after every 15 minutes, there is, of course, a change of the data. And that's why I believe, it's my personal opinion, um, that these changes come from um, this fact, of course. But it is pretty interesting that we have uh, two Kelvins already here. And uh, in the atmosphere, we already had four Kelvin, which is even more. We uh, tried to look at the coast of Gotland. I think the update was taken from here. Uh, the information was taken from here. So um, let's look at other uh, data we have so far. Let's look at the surface pressure uh, from uh, the ICANN model. On the left side, as before, we have the um, coupled simulation and uh, the uncoupled simulation on the right side. And uh, what we see is that there is um, local feedback, of course, it's just a local uh, information uh, which we provide for the atmosphere uh, on, the, on the pressure by the change of the sea surface temperature. But the differences are really low, like, like a really small, like one uh, hectopascal, which is not much, but at least we see something. And um, we also not expected that to see a big gap because otherwise the models would have been uncoupled, not really. <coughs> reasonable, put not, had not, not produced reasonable results. But uh, we see also these small differences within our wind simulation. I hope this will now work because they are getting more and more uh, animations and hopefully the PDF can handle it. Um, so we have here now um, the zonal wind in 10 meters uh, within the atmosphere and we see um, a gap in the, the, in the wind speed, which is uh, due to the fact that we have a difference in the surface and the pressure, and then we have a difference in the wind, of course. And um, we also have to consider that uh, the change of the information given by the sea surface temperature might also just produce um, statistical um, noise. 
So for that, we actually have to do an, kind of an example study to figure out whether these small changes in the wind speed are, are related more to the fact that we have a new sea surface temperature or more to the fact that we have a change in the initialization data in general. So the same is, uh, applies also for the meridional wind, so the northwards wind, if you want. And um, as before, we also see there's only a small change of the information. Um, about the temperature, in two meters height, uh, we, since we have a change in uh, pressure and a change in uh, wind speed, we of course have a change in the temperature. That is what we see here, because we also have just a change in about, about one Kelvin. So it's not much. But as I said before, that's what we hope to see. We hope to see a difference, but uh, not to see uh, a large gap. And um, what is nice uh, that we do not, that even we have coastal upwelling, we do not see a large gap um, on the east of uh, on the coast of Gotland or on the coast, eastern coast of Sweden. We only have a change about one Kelvin, as I said. So even this, there's cold water coming from the, uh, at the, yeah, we, we're, we're closing. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, we, we don't see a lot, a lot of change in the two meter temperature, although we have in the atmosphere now uh, a gap of four Kelvins at the coast of Gotland or coast of uh, Sweden, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, I think this not works anymore. Um, let's have a look at the um, velocities in the ocean. The, that is actually pretty interesting because the ocean is pretty, uh, sm well, the changes in the ocean are pretty small in general. Um, but the difference between the coupled and the uncoupled simulations are actually in the same magnitude. Um, we have not really figured out yet why this is actually the case. Uh, and we cannot really say what is, where is the, the, the model actually heading to. So what, what is uh, the reason for that in general? But what interesting is um, that even the uh, giving, uh, providing the ocean with this uh, information from, the, from meteorological data, there's a big change already. So there will be some influences, uh, especially uh, for if you look into vertical profiles, which we have not done yet, um, for the velocities. And we also see these uh, changes um, within the salinity, which is for the ocean, of course, very interesting. Um, the salinity in this case um, is with the coupled simulation, but increases over, uh, changes increases over time. So continuing our coupled simulations comparing to the uncoupled one, we actually see that their changes in the salinity increases over time. And um, this, I believe, is pretty interesting for the ocean oceanographers. <laughs> so um, I hope we can uh, gain some physical uh, knowledge out of these simulations for the Baltic Sea. And uh, now I want to conclude. So we have now uh, developed and uh, we can make this model available for um, investigations, especially designed for the Baltic Sea, but we can also apply it to different areas as long as we have uh, the data for it. Um, what we already see is that there is a significant feedback related to the coupling. So that provides us uh, with the knowledge that um, we can actually use it rather than my, there, because there was some paper in the, in the literature that they only showed um, a statistical improvement, not a not actually improve uh, difference in the results. And uh, our next part will be um, further developing of the model, uh, for instance, like I said, flux exchanges, and then of course an evaluation and validation of the data. And uh, as already mentioned that we have to look into this uh, noise uh, problem. And then uh, there might be the possibility of uh, adding other components into the model system like waves or even using the uh, multi-scale atmospheric transport model from our institute within ICANN. And my final slide, my last slide, is actually the physics of the uh, inter sea interface we want to achieve 
So we want to exchange uh, the fluxes, the radiations, evaporation, precipitation, and this is what is currently done within uncoupled simulations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very nice talk. Other questions?